once again, Greg Kokel. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I, this is the first time that I've ever been on the stage with a band with somebody wearing a Bass Pro Shops hat. That is very cool. Tight, tight lines, brother. <clears throat> We've been talking about the question of homosexuality and same-sex marriage. My first half, I talked about the biblical teaching regarding homosexuality with the point of informing Christians especially regarding the morality of the behavior. Now I want to transition into a cultural issue that is a policy issue. That means it's something that the government is considering weighing in on and passing legislation regarding that will, I'm trying to think of the best way that I could mention, uh, say this, I said earlier that all legislation forces a point of view, that will force a point of view, a very particular point of view on everybody. And so the discussion is whether this is a good thing for us or not, given the particular question in mind. And I closed the last session by asking why should we treat same-sex relations and heterosexual relations the same way as a policy issue? That's the question. And I'm going to give you three answers that people have offered, and I want to tell you why I don't think those are adequate. And then we're going to get to the crux of the issue. So one thing that people have said is simply it's only fair. Well, it's only fair. In fact, when I was flying oh, from the East Coast a few months ago after New York City had, or the state of New York had passed their same-sex marriage legislation, I remember being in, an, in, I think, Denver Airport and watching on the screen while the CNN was playing, and two men were saying basically that. We, we just want what's fair. We, that's all. We just want to be treated like everybody else. And as I mentioned earlier, this, this is uh, rhetorically powerful, and it's morally powerful, I think, at least at first glance. People think, well, why shouldn't we treat everybody exactly the same. And the heart or the core of this objection is that homosexuals are denied the same rights as heterosexuals, which amounts to unequal protection of the, under the law, which is a violation of the 19th Amendment of the Constitution. And um, here is my response to that. My response is that it's just simply false. There is no legal right granted to me as a citizen, and I'm heterosexual, there's no legal right granted to me that does not apply in exactly the same way to every other citizen, including homosexual citizens. The liberty to marry applies to each citizen in exactly the same way so that everyone is treated exactly alike, which is what the 19th Amendment requires. Any homosexual can marry in any state of the union and receive every one of the privileges and benefits of state-sanctioned matrimony. He just not, cannot marry a member of the same sex, which is a, a restriction that applies to me as well. Now, I know what a homosexual would say to this. They said, well, that's not very satisfying to me that you allow me to marry a woman when I don't want to marry a woman. And my response is, well, if you don't want to marry a woman, you don't have to marry a woman, but don't claim you don't have the same right. You have exactly the same right in exactly the same way. You, just because you have different preferences sexually, do not want to exercise the right that is open to you. Nobody is forcing you to do that. The right is offered to you. So therefore, there is no inequity. What same-sex couples want is the ability to marry each other. But nobody has that right. Nobody has the right to marry whoever they want. Rather, the state will only sanction heterosexual unions. That's it. There's no unequal protection 
under the law. Nobody is denied that right simply because they have sexual attractions for the same sex. That doesn't disqualify them from a right, it disqualifies them from wanting to exercise the right. So there's no unequal protection. The law applies to each individual equally. And by the way, if, if homosexuals face unequal protection in this area, so does every other pair of unmarried citizens who have deep loving commitments to each other. I had a doubles partner for years. Every weekend we'd play tournaments. We had a deep, he's my Christian brother. He stood up with me at my wedding. We had a deep loving commitment. But we didn't get a piece of paper that gave us all additional rights. The government had no interest in doing that. We didn't feel faulted by that. Spinsters in a knitting group, they don't get any special thing because they care for each other. The government's attitude is laissez-faire. You do what you want, our hands off. We have no reason to get involved in your relationship. Which, by the way, is a curiosity because for a long time, this is exactly what the homosexual community was saying. Stay out of our bedroom. Keep the law, your laws off my body kind of thing. Leave us alone. Well, this is what's happened. And now we have a curious change in the last 10 years. Now we want your laws on our body. Now we want you involved. We want laws passed that endorse our way of life. So that's my response to the first objection. Incidentally, um, I put together a little key card here. Virtually everything I have to say from here on out is on this little key card. My whole argument about same-sex marriage and all, answering all the objections is here. Now, if you're an old-timer like me, you have to use a magnifying glass to read it, but it's all there. We've got like six or seven hundred of these in the bookstore, so you can grab one on your way out if you'd like to. Here's the second thing that people have, have said. They've said, well, the reason that we should treat them the same way, that is heterosexual and, and same-sex relationships, as far as the government is concerned, we should treat them the same way, is because homosexuals are denied liberty. They are denied liberty to marry, and they're de denied liberty to love. We should be allowed to love who we want, because after all, marriage is about love. You've heard this before. Now, I know there are a lot of single people here, but those of you who are married, you know good and well that marriage is not about love. <laughs> right? Why is it when you walk down the aisle and you stand up there before the preacher, you say, I promise to have and to hold through thickne thickness, through... That actually would apply, I guess, in some cases. <laughs> Honey, you're a little thicker than you used to be. Uh, <laughs> through sickness and health, good times, bad. You know the routine, right? Book of Common Prayer. Why do you do that? Why do you make a vow? If marriage was just about being in love, in, in, I have no question that love is sometimes what motivates us to get married, but when we're motivated by love to get married, we go up and stand before the preacher and we vow to stay married even if we're not in love. In that moment, for that season, that's why you make the vow, to keep the marriage together when love isn't rich and full and satisfying. And by the way, that happens in every marriage. So marriage is not about love. Ask any married people, person. By the way, and if, if marriage was about love, there are millions of people in the world right now who think they're married, but they aren't. And when you think about the history of the world, most people ne didn't get married for love anyway. They, got, or they were arranged to marriages. And I know culturally that's odd to us, but doesn't it strike you that those are still real marriages? Whether you love each other or not is not on the form. You don't have to fill that in. So, no proof of passion is required because marriage is not about love, and therefore no one, listen carefully, no one is denying any homosexual the liberty to love who they want. Okay? This objection is about liberty. The first objection was about equal protection. The second uh, objection is about liberty. And no one's denying any liberty. Love who you want. Maybe uh, 50 years ago, that wasn't possible, but sure is today. In fact, 
Same-sex couples not only have the liberty to love who they want, but they can also, and I have to put quotes around this, but they can get married if they want. It happens all the time to each other. There are churches all over this country where same-sex couples walk down the aisle. Many of you have been to these ceremonies. Walk down the aisle. They pledge their troth until death do them part. They go on a honeymoon. They buy a house together. They set up housekeeping. They can even, in many states, adopt children. They have the liberty to do everything that married couples can do. Nobody is stopping them. Now, there's something that they don't have. They lack certain entitlements. I'll get to that in a moment, but they don't lack any freedom. Uh, they may lack social validation, but they don't lack any liberty. But this brings me to my next point, and that is the question of discrimination. Same-sex couples do not get the same entitlements. Up till now, I've been pretty much talking about individuals. Individuals have the same rights. Individuals have the same liberties. But now the question is, when you deal with people as, as couples, heterosexual couples get entitlements that same-sex couples do not get. You see the distinction here. And that is discrimination. And to that objection, I say, well, that's absolutely true. There is a difference from a policy perspective on how the state treats same-sex relationships than they tr treat heterosexual relationships. They don't have the same thing, the, the same uh, benefits, if you will, entitlements. That is discrimination. I admit that. But just because there's a distinction doesn't mean the discrimination is an inappropriate or unfair discrimination. Now, the word discrimination is kind of like an ugly word. We think of that, we get it from the 60s mostly, you know, the, the, the civil rights battle, and so we're afraid of ever using that word. But the mark of a, of a, of a balanced, wise person is to make discriminating choices, isn't it? That is, to make distinctions that are legitimate distinctions. So when you walk out of this room and, and you have to, like my little girl did in the swimming pool, have to visit the little girl's room, it's a little girl's room or a big girl's room. And there's a little boy's room and a big boy's room. We don't all go in the same bathroom. That's a discrimination. Is it not a discrimination? Of course it is. But you don't think of it as a bad discrimination because it's completely appropriate, although this is under attack in our culture now. But most of us think it's a completely appropriate dis discrimination because men are made different than women. Plus, they leave the seat up, so, you know. <laughs> and because there is a difference in nature between males and females, we have certain provisions for females that we don't make to males in the same way. We make separate provisions for them. So I'm giving you an example of a kind of discrimination that there's no problem with at all because it's rooted in the way human beings are built. The rule of justice is this, and this applies to whether any discrimination is appropriate or inappropriate. The rule of justice is that you treat equals equally. Let me say it again. You treat equals equally equally. Now, I'm not talking about individuals here. I'm not saying that some individuals are substandard citizens because we're not talking about individuals at this point. We are talking about how the state treats couples. And not all couples are the same before the state because different types of grouping of couples do different things for the culture. So the question is, are same-sex couples and heterosexual couples exactly the same for the purposes of government policy on the issue of marriage. Or another way of putting it is, why is it, what is the reason that heterosexual couples in these specialized circumstances or situations come under the regulation of the law, whereas, marriage law in this case, whereas same-sex couples have no provision for regulation for those relationships? 
Are they equal? And now we're getting to the crux of this issue. Maybe I could put it a different way. Why is it that every government, every nation, every culture, in every period of history, from the dawn of time, this is everybody, have given preferences and privileges and protections and restrictions to long-term committed monogamous heterosexual unions. This isn't just an arbitrary thing that people thought up because they were bigoted. There's a reason why every culture has treated long-term committed heterosexual unions differently. And this brings us to the question of what is marriage. And now we're right at the core of it. Because what I'm going to offer you right now is the hinge pin everything else uh, hinges on with regards to this issue. There are only two kinds of answers to the question, what is marriage? And if you're taking notes, I'm going to go slowly so you get this down. There are only two kinds of answers to the question, what is marriage? Either marriage has a fixed natural purpose or not. Either marriage is something in particular or it's nothing in particular and therefore anything we want to make it. Either marriage is something described or it's something defined. Something discovered or something invented. That's the question. Now for the history of mankind there has been only one answer to that question. And it's captured in Jesus' common sense observation. And I introduce Jesus here as a person, well-respected religious leader with great wisdom, not as a theological authority figure. So I'm not trumping this thing with Jesus' words right now. I'm saying Jesus is a guy by everybody's characterization who, you know, had got a few things right. Here's what Jesus did. He said this in Matthew 19, 44 through 6. He said, he who created them from the beginning made them male and female. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus of Nazareth based an argument about marriage. That's what he was talking about there. On a simple observation of the created order that anybody can make. Male, female. Humans are made male and female. Nature itself then, I think, gives us the answer to the definition of marriage. In other words, marriage is not defined. The word marriage isn't just invented, made up, and you can fill in the blanks however you want to. Marriage is a word that is used to describe something that is already there in the natural order. It's not invented by man. It's, re it's rooted in the fixed natural order of nature. So here's my definition. I'll go slowly. Marriage is a natural, long-term pairing between a man and a woman that is pr protected, privileged, and celebrated by culture because of the unique and vital role it plays in civilization. I'll give you that again. Marriage is a natural, long-term pairing between a man and a woman that, as a culture, we see the value of so it's protected and privileged and celebrated because it does something unique and vital. As a group, as a rule, and by nature, marriage relationships produce the next generation. As a rule, as a group, no other group does this, and by nature, this is the way we were made to function. It produces the next generation. This is why cultures, communities, governments care about the stability of that unique relationship in ways that it is not committed to intervening or caring about any other kind of relationship. And if this is true, then marriage licenses don't create marriages. Marriage comes before marriage licenses. In other words, it, it comes before the culture's formal recognition of it. And by the way, it would still exist even if cultures didn't formally recognize it. Men and women would still pair up. 
for long periods of time and have children. Marriage as a legal institution just simply maps over that natural institution that's already there from the beginning. And if the government culture encourages it properly, then it strengthens the natural institution. And if it decides to go in another direction, that institution doesn't go away. Marriage still is what it is because it's something described, not defined. You can't redefine it. You can try, but it doesn't go away. Like my friend Frank Beckwith, philosopher, said, he's given to cute sayings and clever witticisms. He said, just because you can eat an ashtray doesn't make it food. Nature, reality, if you will, has already dictated what marriage is. So that's my case. Same-sex marriage seeks to redefine something it cannot ultimately alter, and that is the natural order. And since this order is fundamental to civilization, tampering with it invites trouble. Remember I said, you can either encourage the natural institution or you can discourage the natural institution. You can work with it or you could work against it. And as I said, from the very beginning, if this is a natural institution that God himself has ordained for the protection of society and for the reduction of evil, if we tamper with this, evil will increase. So, objections. There's still a handful more that now come into play. Marriage is constantly being redefined. So this is taking the view that marriage is not something you describe. It's a fixed thing that's part of reality, but it's something that cultures invent and then redefine. And so they look back in history and say, we've constantly been redefining the, uh, marriage. And my answer is that marriage has not been in flux the way people suggest. I mean, there have been variations on the theme, but that doesn't mean that the theme hasn't been there. Of the age of consent of marriage has changed. Whether someone has more than one wife or not, th that's changed. Some people were prohibited from marrying, but the definition of marriage has not been changed. It's always been between a man and a woman. And it's always been that way because that's what makes a family. Similar to this is people who say, well, marriage is a social construction. You know, social construction is something that the society decides to invent. So that we sit in pews in church, this is social construction. Some, some places in the world, they don't sit in pews. This is an American thing. And so uh, we can kind of redefine this because we invented this idea to begin with. We can uninvent it and invent something else. That's the argument. The response is that marriage, it is impossible for marriage to be a social construction. Think about it. Cultures emerge when humans reproduce. Successful reproduction requires stable families, and families begin with marriages. So in order to get a culture to construct anything, first you have to have marriages that make families that are the foundation of cultures to begin with. The bricks come before the building, not the building before the bricks. Cultures do not construct marriage. Oh, well, they say the same thing about interracial marriage. So what? It doesn't matter whether they say the same thing about it. It only matters whether the circumstances are the same. It was a terrible thing when interracial marriage was banned. And you know, by the way, why it was reversed is because our politicians realized that it went against the natural order <laughs> because the natural order for men and women to be unified and the skin color has, makes no difference whatsoever because skin color is irrelevant to marriage. But sex, no, not irrelevant. It's central to marriage. That's why there's no comparison. And by the way, the people who offer this kind of challenge, they said the same thing about interracial marriage. Will that work for them when people bring polygamy into the game? No, you can't have polygamy. That's not right. Oh, that's the same thing they said about interracial marriage. No, it doesn't work there. It doesn't work now. These are totally different circumstances. Well, not all marriages have children, and that's true. But that doesn't prove anything. 
because the natural marriage procreation connection is not nullified because in some cases children aren't wanted or maybe you, for some reason you can't have children. That doesn't change the argument that I've offered. <clears throat> and I know that same-sex couples are allowed to adopt and people offer that, see, that, that changes your argument. And my response is simply this, they should not be allowed to. What? Why not? For the same reason that single people shouldn't be allowed to. Both of those subvert the natural order. This is my argument. There is a natural order in place that protects families. Man and a woman make a family, and a man and a woman are necessary to properly raise a family. And when I say necessary, I mean ideally. My wife was 16 years a single mom before I married her. Some people get through that, and they do a pretty good job. But nobody in that situation would argue it's ideal. Children need a mother and a father. My little girls, my seven-year-old Abby and my four-year-old Eva, they need me as a dad. But they don't just need me. They need mom to protect them from dad. <laughs> right? Children need both a mom and a dad, and this is so, so um, self-evident. It's amazing that anyone t would take exception with it, but people do. Um, by licensing same-sex marriage, society would be declaring by law that two men and two women are equally suited to raise a child, that mothers and fathers contribute nothing unique to healthy child rearing. And this is self-evidently false. Moms and dads are not interchangeable. So what I've tried to do is I've tried to offer some a rationale based on nature, not based on bigotry, based on what nature seems to dictate that the rest of the world from the beginning of time has easily recognized. I've tried to answer some of the objections that are offered. And now I want to answer the last issue, and that is, well, what's the harm? How is it going to hurt me? Now, I, I, I saved it for last because this is the least important of the issues, because it's, it's kind of a self-centered issue. Well, if it doesn't hurt me, do what you want. Regardless of whether it hurts anybody else, it seems to be the kind of thing. But that's where a lot of people are nowadays. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you four things. And write these down because these you're going to feel if same-sex marriage gets established. <clears throat> because when you say that marriage is a matter of definition... It's not a natural thing dictated by nature, but it's a matter of any way we want to define it, we can define it, then what you are saying is, by law, marriage is anything we want to make it. That's it. That's, that's the justification. But if it's anything, it could be anything. So what about polygamy? What about polyandry? More than one husband. What about... Uh, polyamory, group marriage. Well, when you raise this, uh, pe people on the other side will say, well, that's ridiculous. And my response is, you're right, it is ridiculous. But it follows from your view. You're the one who's saying that marriage is whatever we want to make it. So what is your principled objection to any of these things, which, by the way, every one of them is in the wings right now, waiting to get into court once same-sex marriage is passed, based on on the same justification. Because once we say that marriage is just a matter of definition, then marriage is nothing in particular, families are nothing in particular, parenting is nothing in particular, it's just simply a matter of how you want to define it. And I'll tell you the way it'll hurt you, four ways, it'll hurt you in personal liberty. It will hurt you in personal liberty. That means your personal liberties will be infringed. How many know that eHarmony got sued because it doesn't make same-sex matchings? How many know that? I just heard it today. eHarmony got sued 
This is a Christian organization who put together a wonderful matching system but didn't provide for matching for same-sex couples. They got sued, and after a lot of legal pressure, they gave in. You think this isn't going to hurt anybody? You think you're, you're, you're going to be able to go on with all of your personal convictions, doing what you want according to your own conscience? After this gets passed, forget about it. You heard about the photographer in Albuquerque, New Mexico, who was asked to photograph a same-sex wedding? And she said, you know, by my conscience, I can't do that. I have friends that will be willing to do it. Here's their cards. And instead of going to somebody else who is willing to do it, these people sued the Christian photographer. Personal liberties. Uh, by the way, I can give you all kinds of examples. Look at it. In July 2004, when this first thing came up in California about same-sex marriage, we went and petitioned Google for ads on the side. You know, when you type in same-sex marriage, we have ads for things that I'd written that are on our website, str.org. str.org. That are on our website so people can go read them and get the other side. Google read the articles and declared our site a hate site and canceled our ads. Why were we a hate site? Because we thought homosexuality was immoral. Personal liberties. Secondly, you will lose parental rights. Remember, who gets to decide what family is? The government gets to decide what family is on this way of thinking. And Dave and Tony Parker in Lexington, uh, Maine, found out that their children, their, their um, it's a second grader, I don't know if it was a boy or a girl, were going to get instructed in Maine, which has same-sex marriage, on homosexuality. They said, no way, we're opting out. And the state of Maine said, you cannot opt out. Because in the state of Maine, same-sex marriage is legal. You cannot opt out. I got, a, I got a third grader. I can't even countenance my third grader being exposed to these kinds of things. She is not old enough to manage that information, and here a second grader is forced to be indoctrinated against the views of the parents. Think it won't hurt you? Loss of personal rights. Three, you'll lose religious freedom. The largest adoption provider in the state of Maine was the Roman Catholic Church. The largest adoption provider in the state of Maine was the Roman Catholic Church. I have two adopted girls. Do you think this means something to me? Do you think I realize the significance of this? They were forced out of business in the state of Maine because they would not consider same-sex couples as options when heterosexual couples were available. They discriminated. They bought the crazy idea that kids need a mom and a dad. And they were forced out of business. Rhode Island school bans father-daughter dances, says they break the law. This is two days ago. I got this yesterday. The ACLU lawyer said this was blatant gender stereotyping. And after all, this is 2012. Those were his words. You think it's going to get easier when same-sex marriage is the law of the land? Well, not only will you lose personal liberty, not only will you lose parental rights and religious freedoms, that's three, you will give the government and the lawyers a huge club to punish dissent. Look what happened to Chick-fil-A in Chicago. By the way, Heterosexual marriage is the law of the state of Illinois. All they did, all, all uh, Kathy did, the owner of Chick-fil-A, is express his support for classical marriage, and the people who run that city came unglued. I was sitting in the Denver airport listening to them. I had to put my earplugs in. I was so angry. I, I got my earplugs out and put it in. I got so mad. And the mayor of Chicago said, if you don't hold our values, you cannot work in our city. 
Many of you heard the same thing. You think this isn't going to have an impact? This is what's happening now before it's the law of the land. I'm sorry, but you ought to be shaking in your shoes thinking of the consequences just to you, not to society at large, if this thing becomes the law of the land. If it does, three things will rapidly follow. Homosexuality will be officially and legally declared normal. That's what the law will say. Heterosexual unions, same-sex unions, exactly the same as far as the law is concerned. Second, anyone continuing to make gender distinctions dictated by nature will run afoul of laws dictated by men. And uh, the, the, this group is especially litigious, by the way, in case you hadn't noticed, and especially aggressive. This is an, uh, simply observation. It's con not condemnation. It's not condescension. It's just these people need, mean business. And third, the definition of marriage will not stop changing. It will continue to expand as the state continues to tinker. And marriage and family and parenthood will continue to be redefined and polygamy and polyandry and polyamory and all other creative variations will be justified by the same logic. And why take all this risk? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you what's going on. This issue is not about securing legitimate liberties for an oppressed minority. As I've said already, that's not what's going on. There is tremendous tolerance, not only for homosexuality, but for same-sex relationships in this country. <clears throat> the real reason why so many homosexuals are pushing for same-sex marriage is not for liberties, but it is for respect and social validation. Every single time you see one of these things passed in a local state, and now they're starting to happen more often, you just listen to the news and hear what people say. It was a moving experience after a truly lifelong commitment to have the government entity say, your relationship is valid in the eyes of the law. These are citations, by the way. That piece of paper is just so important, I can't even put words to it. It's so important to have society support you. It's about society saying you're recognized as a couple. Andrew Sullivan, homosexual activist, well-known in this country, the intellectual force behind gay marriage, has written, including homosexuals within marriage would be the means of conferring the highest form of social approval imaginable. You see, this isn't about getting equal rights. This isn't about loving who you want to love. This isn't about uh, getting liberties that you don't have. This is about one group strong-arming the rest of the country, forcing it with threats and intimidation and with laws and judges to say it approves of something that most don't approve of. It's a radical attempt at civil engineering using government muscle to strong-arm people into a, accommodating a lifestyle that many find deeply offensive, contrary to nature, socially destructive and morally repugnant. Some don't, but many do, and this is being forced upon us. It's a radical move, and it strikes me as naive to expect that you can take a sledgehammer to the foundations of culture, the family, and not expect it to suffer any ill effect. Homosexuality is broadly tolerated in this culture, in this society, it's not universally approved of, but, but homosexuals have the liberty to live as they please, to do as they please, without fear of reprisal by and large. And I think this is all anyone has a right to demand. So you have to decide whether you want to completely re-engineer the foundational institution of civilization in order to validate and approve of homosexuality, or do you want to affirm and strengthen the natural institution marriage and family, while you're willing to live peacefully alongside of those who make different lifestyle choices. You decide. Thank you.